Has anyone here ever, you got kids, raise your hands if you have kids and grandkids. And a dog and a cat, whatever. Parakeet, goldfish. And you want to go on vacation. And you said, come on, we're leaving. And, and it's so hard. You plan for days, weeks, and months to go on your vacation. And you can't get everybody in the car. Anybody? Come on, we're leaving. That's the name of my message. Oh, not up there. Everybody say, come on, we're leaving. How many of you know we're getting ready to leave this planet? Jesus is coming for his church. So come on, we're leaving. Now, if you knew you were going on vacation with me tomorrow, now that, that's, maybe you don't want to go with me tomorrow. Let's just say you're going on vacation tomorrow. I, I called you in and I said, listen, I'm going I'm to pay for your vacation. All expenses paid, uh, seven days to Hawaii. All expenses paid. But you've got to leave in the morning at 6 o'clock. Woo, Honolulu, I want to go there, don't you? Amen. Been there, done that. All right. So, how many of you would spend the greater portion of your evening and the dark hours of the night, even into the wee hours of the morning, making plans to get everything covered? You know, somebody's got to make sure the newspaper's not laying in the driveway. Somebody's going to make sure that uh, their, their house's sitting. Somebody's got to come over and walk the dog. Somebody's got to come feed the goldfish. You'd be making all kinds of plans, right? And then you'd get up in the morning, have the whole family, y'all get up early because you can't sleep, kids couldn't sleep, and, and you're trying to get them all in the car. And finally, you get them all in the car. And you're backing out of the driveway, and little Susie says, I got to pee. And you, you pull back in, she runs in, takes care of her business, she comes back out. You drive down the, about three blocks, and, uh, and John says, little Johnny says, are we there yet? Anybody? But how many of y'all ready to go to heaven, but your family's not, your loved one's not, your neighbor's not, your co-workers aren't, and some of your, quote, Christian, all right, not, that's not a good example, friends are not ready. And so we want to get them ready, right? Now you think about it, as we are going to discuss, as we have for the two previous services, we're going to talk about Moses walking like an Egyptian, and we're going to talk about them Israelites. So let me just kind of cut to the chase. You know, you can take the Israelites out of Egypt, but now God's got to get Egypt out of the Israelites. You can take a country boy, a boy out of the country, but it's hard to get the country out of the boy. How many times have y'all sat in this church in 32 years and, talked and heard me talk about me being a country boy? You know, there were some times in my life I lived in town. That's where I learned not to use the word ain't. So... I want you to think about the children of Israel. They have been in captivity, and during some portion of that 430 years of captivity, they were enslaved. Now, they were not enslaved the whole 430 years, and that's how sin works. When you become a child of this world, you may not be enslaved from birth, but at some point, sin's going to take you further than you want to go, cost you more than you want to pay, and then you're engrossed in it and can't get out. So that's really kind of the story of the Israelites. We know that they moved to Egypt because there was a famine. And Joseph had taken over as prime minister and basically taken over the economy uh, because of him being appointed to his new position. Uh, to store up wheat during the, uh, during the seven years of harvest and plenty. So there was a seven-year famine. And as a result, uh, you know the story how they got connected with Bubba, that's Joseph. And then they went and got Dad and brought him. And they, all the Jews then ended up in Egypt. It started out great. The problem is, like most frequently, you find God's covenant people get blessed. Everybody say blessed. blessed. Now, they were prosperous, numerous, fruitful. Even though they weren't living in the promised land, they were living in Egypt, they were still living under the covenant. Everybody say covenant. covenant. How many of y'all living under the blood covenant? Yeah. And I always find it fascinating that people take such offense at this word that's actually in the Bible more than once. Prosperity. Increase. Even before the law, be fruitful, multiply, be fruitful, multiply, increase, replenish. So, very interesting when we see these stories and we think about this. In 
these passages of Scripture, what I'm going to endeavor to do here over the next few, uh, is 30 minutes, a few minutes. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to try to kind of lay out this foundation to get you to get ready to leave. Now, there's two principles that I'm going to try to get you to see here. Uh, I know the ladies here, and y'all can think with both sides of your brains at the same time. But I'm a man, so I'm on, I have difficulty flipping from one side of my brain to the other. Uh, so what I'm going to try to help you see, and I pray the Holy Spirit will help you see this, is that we're going to parallel being born again, coming out of the world, and coming, being translated out of darkness, gross darkness, darkness in Egypt that was so dense it could be felt. And one thing that they say about the Asbury revival is people walk into the chapel they've moved it from the chapel now, is they felt God's presence. They felt it. Well, who is God? God is light, right? So they felt it. Well, this dense darkness in Egypt, which was commemorated Tuesday and Wednesday of last week, Wednesday being Ash Wednesday, that dense darkness that took over Egypt was felt. Have you ever been so deeply engrossed in sin that you felt the heaviness of it? Some call that oppression. So we are translated out of darkness into light and the kingdom of his son. That's Colossians 1.13. Now at the same time, we're seeing the types and shadows of Egypt being the world, Pharaoh being the God of this world, Moses, the lawgiver, the deliverer, Joshua being Yeshua, Messiah, the type of Christ. We see Moses, the lawgiver, and the law can bring you, according to Galatians, the law has a purpose. And what is it? To bring you to Christ. Now, this is why I believe God showed me, and maybe you already knew this, but, you know, I've only been serving the Lord 50 years, so help me out here, that the reason Moses did not take the children of Israel into the promised land, well, was it because he sinned or was it because he hit the rock instead of talking to the rock? It's because he's the lawgiver. And the law, law is to bring you to Christ. But Christ, Messiah, Jesus, and Joshua, Yeshua, is the one who brings us out of the law and out of dense darkness and brings us into the kingdom of his son, the kingdom of light. This is some of the types and shadows that we see here in the book of Exodus that God is so masterful is saying, you know, I just want you to see this right here. If you can see what I'm doing here, when I actually do it, you'll have a better understanding of it with all you're getting, good understanding. So in, in Exodus, we know chapter 1, they're now being assigned taskmasters. We know that they've called out and cried out to God. And when they begin to cry out and moan to God, God hears his people, remembers his covenant, and he burns, he sets the, the bush on fire. Moses has been on that backside of Midian Desert, tending his father-in-law's sheep, learning how to lead sheep. Jesus is our shepherd. We are his sheep of his pasture, correct? So Moses has been in, in pretty serious training. Realize Moses spent 40 years in Egypt. Now, God is having to get rid of all that Egyptian pride, ego, whatever he had that caused him to think he could get away with killing a guy as a deliverer. So God has spent now 40 years taking care of Moses, removing some of the issues that he had been infected with. How many of you know you're born naturally infected with sin? You have a sin nature. So now he has spent 40 years, he's standing at the burning bush. God says, uh, Moses, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to send you to deliver them. Of course, we know all the excuses that I've covered. And Moses says, well, who am I? So God says, this, just do what I tell you to do. And God says and gives Moses and the children of Israel a promise. Everybody say a promise. How many of you know there's promises in the Word of God? How many of you, even though you have not received what it is you're believing God for, you've read the Scripture and you believe He's promised you that, and you're sometimes frustrated. I read the Scripture. He said, He'll bless everything I put my hand to, and I'm still broke. 
He said, by his stripes I am healed. He forgives all my iniquities and heals all my diseases, Psalms 103. But how come I still have a disease? The doctor has confirmed it. He showed me, he or she showed me the chart. And it's frustrating. Anybody? So here we have a promise from God, yet this is chapter 3, and they don't leave town till round about chapter 12, 13, 14. So sometimes, like seed time and harvest, there's a period of time that God's doing something that maybe we don't fully understand how it's working. You know, we say it all the time, you know, uh, God will take that which is meant for our harm and turn it for our good. Hi, I'm Perry Black right here at Second Chance Youth Ranch TV on Victory Television Network. And I'd like to invite you personally to join us every Thursday night at 11 p.m. as we look at the need for fostering, adoption, and mentoring. And what a great opportunity you have to join us every Thursday night at 11 p.m. right here on Victory Television Network. And I look forward to seeing you. So I will stretch, he says to Moses, I will stretch out my hand. I will smite Egypt with all my wonders. Now, here's what I've always wondered. How, I know I serve a God of grace. We're in the grace dispensation, correct? The judgment of God was poured out on the cross. Now, there's, Jesus is coming to judge the living and dead, but we're in grace dispensation. And if you're really, if you're really sweet tonight, you'd say, thank you, Jesus. Because some of you need some forgiving. I'm talking to people watching, not y'all. No, I'm not talking to any of you. So, how, did God, how could God do that to the Egyptians? Number one, because he's God. And he has the authority and the right to execute judgment. He does not do that right now. If he did, we wouldn't be dealing with all this crazy, would we? He didn't execute judgment. He'd just bless us. Everybody would be a happy family. But see, the cross hasn't come yet. Jesus hadn't come to go to the cross. So, simply, he says, uh, I will stretch out my hand, I will smite Egypt. Now, remember, if you think about the big umbrella of what we're talking about here, umbrella says because it's raining. The big umbrella of what we're talking about here, while we still have electricity, praise the Lord, amen, is, is God is going to reveal himself Stretching out his hand, smiting Egypt with all these wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, Pharaoh, he will let you go. Here's your promise. Pharaoh's going to let you go. Now, if I said, let's go to McDonald's, some of y'all would get up and go right now. But there's a process of time of what God has something beyond just bringing deliverance to them. Actually, I'm going to hopefully show you a scripture or two here where God is actually endeavoring to show himself as God to the Egyptians. To the Egyptians. To those in the world. He said, I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall come to pass that when you go, see, God's a faith God. He's just now talking to Moses but he's telling them, and he's telling Moses, y'all are going to go. I'm telling you, I'm God, and I'm telling you, you're going to go. So you'd think they'd just all get up and leave right then. So just because God's given you a promise doesn't mean he's not going to fulfill it just because you're still believing God. Because this entire story is God getting his people to believe him. First, he has to get Moses to believe him. We've got too many churches where the preachers don't believe. I'm preaching as much to you as I am to myself. I am not. I'm already living this. So I'm not preaching to me a lot of times. Now, what I've done, what I am doing, I'm believing that God's speaking to me. I'm making sure I got it. 
So before I tell you, I, I'm now not preaching to me because I already got it. I've already heard from the Lord. If I needed to repent, needed to do something, do an action, or, or quit something, I'm already doing it. So I'm not going to come in here and say, yeah, I know I'm doing the same thing you are. You never will hear me say, I'm preaching as much to me as I am to you. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it will come to pass that when we go, you will not go empty-handed. But every woman will borrow of her neighbor. In one context, that word borrow, some scholars say, and I went back and looked at the original Hebrew, said they really didn't ask. They said, I'd like that. They actually demanded it. In other words, they requested it. They didn't really ask, can I have it? They said, I'd like to have that. And God gave them favor with the worldly, the worldly Egyptians who possessed it. And they were so favored in the eyes of the Egyptians that they said, well, sure, you can have that. That is pretty, can I say dadgum? That's pretty dadgum awesome. You shall not go empty him. You shall borrow of your neighbor. Because if you've borrowed, you've got to give it back. And, uh, and, uh, and of her that sojourns in her house, jewels of silver, gold, raiment. Uh, and you shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters. And you shall spoil the Egyptians. Now, I'm just, there's so much I want to cover. Y'all don't know how hard this is sometimes. I'm like Nadia Comaneci. You remember when she made the original tins? She made it look easy. This is way harder than it looks. Or if this looks hard, it is. <laughs> when you, you take this story, which is really the, the entire gospel in a type and shadow, and try to break this down. Now, there's been going around. I know most of you have heard this. I mentioned the word prosperity. Some of you oh, I don't like prosperity. Okay, stay broke. Uh, in these last days, there's going to be a transfer of wealth. Have you all heard that? And everybody, you know, everybody to convince you, you know, thousands of people, whoa, glory, and they get a hanky, whoa, they're going to be a transfer of wealth. I don't have to do anything to get it, whoa. All right, whatever. Why wait? The moment you left the kingdom of darkness and got born again and became a child of God, a child of God, <laughs> everything you need is available by faith. You get that? By faith. By faith. That means, as I've said, there's a promise. Now, there may be some chapters in your life before you actually possess it physically, but it's yours already spiritually. Therefore, you stand all, having done all, you fight the good fight of faith, fully covered in the armor of God, head to toe, and you're going to fight with the sword of the Spirit and the shield of faith until you actually receive it. And once you receive it, you continue to walk in faith, or the devil come take it from you. I'm going to try to teach this. Somebody making me preach this. Which of you is that? So it's not a matter of the God's, not, God's not saying no. It's just there's a process many times because God's developing stuff in us. And God often, because he's God and there's a whole bunch of people on the planet, he's got a greater purpose in mind in every situation than just paying your electric bill. Or putting bread on your table. God's a big God. He loves the whole world, you know. Jesus loves the little children, all the little children of the world. Doesn't he? So there's the promise. Now the reason I read that, because this is chapter 3, and God keeps repeating this promise, as he often does to us. At what point in my life, or yours, does this promise of salvation no longer be extended to us? God says, you know, Perry, you've outlived your salvation. You mean it's only a 50-year plan, Lord? What, at what point do I outlive, uh, I desire by all the things you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers? At what point do you outlive these problems? Never. Matter of fact, what, I, what I'm fa I was talking about Janet. I was talking to Janet. Y'all know I'm talking fast. I, I was talking to Janet on the way to church. I, I, I am just blown away at the Word of God. After all these years, I get so excited that it's hard for me to tell you all this stuff. Because I just get caught up in the enthusiasm and the passion of it and the excitement of God. Doing what he... Can I tell you this? Watch this. 
Now there's a problem. See, I started with a promise. This is how it folds right here in Scripture. But then there's a problem. Moses says to Pharaoh, speaking through, at this particular stage, speaking through Moses. In other words, he says, Moses, tell him. Moses, tell him. You know, that's what God's doing right now. He appointed the apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, and teacher, the fivefold ministry offices. God speaks to them and speaks to his people. Now, wonderful part of New Testament Christianity because Jesus came to live in each of us and sends the Holy Spirit to each of us. He'll also talk to each of us too. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that God doesn't speak through men and, this is offensive, women of God. Saddleback Church, they've been kicked out of the Southern Baptist Convention because they appointed a female pastor. Whoa, that puts your hair on fire, won't it, Roger? So here's the problem. He says, Pharaoh, God said, let my people go. So Pharaoh says, listen, you come up in, now I'm paraphrasing, y'all do understand this. He says, he says, y'all come up in here with the elders of Israel and, and uh, your Bubba here, Aaron, and now everybody's goofing off and y'all not making your bricks. And so you, you just... You're not, doing your day, you're not doing your daily allotment. So I tell you what, get out of here. Who is the Lord? I don't believe in him. So y'all leave. And now that you got me, the Pharaoh, the God of this world mad, you got to pick your own straw too. You got to harvest your straw. And so now here Moses, the guy for, that's left the backside of the desert with a word from God and a promise from God, he's now standing before Pharaoh. And now the people's lives have gotten harder. So you have the promise, and here comes these problems. Well, just give you, we know, I've told people this early on my Christian, just give your life to Jesus, and you'll never have another problem. Boy, that's a lie. Jesus solves the sin problem, but man, then the devil comes. So then uh, Moses kind of got discouraged, seemed to be discouraged, because the people are now, the people that he didn't even want to go tell, that he obeyed God and went to tell, now, they're mad at Moses, and so Moses is like, no strong for big. Well, that's a bummer. Now the people are mad at me, and God, it doesn't seem like you're doing anything. You've never had that thought. It doesn't seem like God's doing anything. So we've now moved to Exodus 6. Then the Lord said to Moses, now, shalt thou see that what I will go to Pharaoh, go with us, and he says, now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand shall he let the people go. And with a strong hand, he won't just let them go. He's going to drive the people out of here. Now, you know the story, though, right? You know about all the, the flies, the locusts, the frogs, the hellfire, all that stuff. And Pharaoh just hangs on, hangs on. Finally, he says, in the middle of the night after the firstborn, when the angel of death passes through, and we're going to spend a whole lot of time on the Passover, but not tonight. He says, in the middle of the night, he calls Moses and Aaron and says, leave, get out of here. And he drove them out with a strong hand. And God spake unto Moses and said to Moses, I am the Lord. Now, some translations uses the word Yahweh. Some translations uses the word Jehovah. God says, I am Jehovah, reminding Moses of the great name of God. He confirmed that he remained covenant-making and covenant-keeping. God is not a man that he should lie. If God would ever lie, he's disqualified and is no different than the devil. This is the Word of God, and our God cannot lie. You say, well, what's taking him so long? God doesn't wear a Timex. He wears a Rolex. That's just to irritate people that are flipping channels. God doesn't wear a watch. God is a watchman. And he's looking, his eyes look out through all the earth, looking for somebody who will stand in the gap and make up the hedge. Who's willing to be criticized, analyzed, psychologicalized. And will keep on 
being faithful and standing on his promises, trusting and believing God, whether people like him or not, whether he wins the popularity contest or not. Meyer says, when all human help has failed and the soul is exhausted and despairing, has given up hope for man, God draws near and says, I am the Lord. Oh, mercy, mercy, mercy. This God we serve is not a deaf God. He's not a way off somewhere God. He's the God who is the great I am. He says, as I appeared unto Abraham and Isaac and to Jacob by the name of God Almighty, which was El Shaddai, they did not know him as extensively or as intimately as, intimately as Moses. But how many of you respect and admire Moses? Raise your hand. And he wasn't even born again. He didn't have Jesus on the inside. Oh, I done preached myself happy. He moves in on the inside. This great I am, this Yahshua, this Messiah moves in on the inside. He said, I appeared uh, to them as God Almighty, El Shaddai, but by that I revealed myself to Moses as Jehovah, the existing one. Boy, that's an all-encompassing one. He said, so tell them I'm the Lord, and I'm going to bring them out. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. So here's the purpose. Watch this. There is actually a purpose. Exodus 7, 5, and the Egyptians shall know that I'm the Lord when I stretch forth my hand. Oh, what? The, who will know? Who will know? The Israelites? When God brings them out, who's going to know? Come on, it's, it's actually, I'm not going to let y'all go just because it's quit raining. Who's, who's going to know? Do you mean to tell me God's interested in the Egyptians? Oh, sooky, sooky. He's interested in the Egyptians. You know, all those people that we're mad at all time, all the people that we criticize and we say we're not like them, you know, that's the Egyptians. You know what God wants to do through his mighty hand and through his, his, the way he does things for us and in our life is to reveal himself to the world. You know, the world that's not here, the world that's not viewing right now. 